When folks are in a chronic stress state, what happens physiologically? There's a number of things that happen that, as you'll see, probably underlie every chronic pain state, every chronic uh, functional disease, every chronic illness that we have. There's increased inflammation in the body, okay? There's a lot of cytokine release. There's, uh, when we're in a chronic stress state, it sensitizes the neurology, it affects our cognitive function. For those of you who do pain management, so much of what we see in pain, these nerves are hypersensitized, sending a false or magnified message to people's brains, right? I see a lot of interstitial cystitis. These women will urinate, 10 minutes later they gotta pee again. We know they're emptying the bladder, we know they're not infected, the bladder usually looks normal. That problem's not going in their head. It's true, these hypersensitized nerves are sending a message to their brain telling them they have to urinate all the time. So the problem's not in their head, it is in their brain and nervous system though, okay? When we're under chronic stress, there's a lot of muscular tension and bracing patterns in the body. This is what I mean briefly by a tension and bracing pattern. Do most, uh, most people I know have errors in their body where they store tension. Some people it's in their jaw, they get TMJ all the time. Even at nighttime, they're asleep, their jaw's clenching. Some people it's their neck and shoulders. That's where my wife stores it. If I want to massage that woman an hour a night, she'd take it, okay? <laughs> Some people it's their back, their buttocks, their, you know, your obvious, I see a lot of pelvic floor. So the thing with this muscle tension and bracing patterns is that you, know, you can go to a massage therapist, they rub you, they're digging their elbow in, it feels good. But then two days later, you go back to your life or that coworker, that spouse, and the same muscles lock up again. That's a tension and bracing pattern. Very, very difficult to break. Um, when we're in a stress physiology, the viscera don't work well. So you can think of stuff like IBS, um, um, overactive bladder, things like that. The viscera just don't function well. There's immune system dysregulation. Either people just don't, don't heal well from what they have, there may be autoimmune diseases. You know, we've got one of our nurses, she's young, and she's young, every, literally once a month, she's got a cold or a flu, once a month. So her immune system obviously is not doing what it's supposed to do, okay? Lastly, chronic stress state, cardiovascular pulmonary issues, you can think of like uh, all the arrhythmias, the SVTs, AFib, that's like that. There, there's increased hypertension. With hypertension, there's probably increased sympathetic tone that's running, right? Make sense? Okay, so almost any chronic illness you see, you start asking what actually is going on physiologically, okay? Uh, almost everyone has some combination of these things, right, for our chronic players. And then, what, why are they having these? If you look upstream, it's because they're locked in a stress physiology. Thanks. Who's familiar with the ACE study? Just two, huh? Two or three, yeah? Adverse childhood. Adverse childhood experiences yeah. study? But not really, maybe a fourth of the room, okay. This study is very pertinent. It was done at Kaiser San Diego. Um, they looked at 17,000 middle-aged uh, folks, middle income. They followed these people for two decades. <clears throat> the A study revealed a powerful relationship between childhood trauma and adult physical and emotional health, major illnesses, early death, okay? So what the A study did, it looked at categories of adverse childhood experiences, and they looked specifically at things like recurrent physical, emotional, sexual abuse, a depressed, mentally ill, or suicidal family member, an incarcerated family member, mother treated violently in the house, parents separated, divorced, or lost to the child. Okay. Now, interestingly, in the and, and by the way, since the A study came out, there's been at least 2,000 papers written about it. There's a massive, massive amount of data on it. Okay. Um, what the A interestingly did not look at is other big stressors that may affect many of us, folks growing up in areas with you know low socioeconomic class, poverty, war, a lot of violence in your neighborhood. Um, the LGBT community, there's generally a lot of people who are ostracized that can be very stressful growing up. Um, bullying, it's bullying at school. Uh, childhood medical procedures, by the way, are extremely traumatic. There's some data that shows that kids, that 50% of kids that have orthopedic surgery end up with PTSD. Now, how I define PTSD is something happens, your body goes into a fight, flight, freeze state, and that stays on autopilot, okay? Most people associate PTSD to like these guys with anxiety or depression, isn't that right? So what we're learning from the science, I think, most people think our thoughts and emotions affect our body, right? That's kind of, okay, that's a top-down approach. I believe what the science is starting to show, it's actually a bottoms-up approach, meaning that the majority of our thoughts and emotions are actually coming from our body and our physiology. So if someone's locked in a chronic fight, flight, free state, it affects their thoughts and emotions. Whether you want to label it as depression, anxiety, bipolar, ADHD, PTSD, or whether you want to label it, I'm, I, I don't feel good about myself, I'm sad, angry, guilty, whatever, okay? 
much of this up here is coming from the body and the physiology. So as we shift the physiology, which is what these TRE exercises seem to do, a lot of folks start, uh, feel their, their, their thoughts and emotions start getting better. Clear? Okay. The ACE study, okay. The more adverse childhood experiences one had, 65% of people in this country have had at least one, and then a number of, a number of folks have had you know, a number of ACEs, okay? There was dramatic increased risk of cardiovascular disease, lung disease, diabetes, headaches, multiple sclerosis, lupus, strokes, cancer, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, the psychiatric stuff, depression, suicide attempts, substance abuse, hyperactivity, obesity, short life expectancy, and pain. That's a lot of stuff, huh? It's a lot of stuff. How do ACEs cause disease? Okay, now when Dr. Felitti first presented this study, I forget it was some big national meeting, I mean maybe it was like NIH or some big place. He went and told this people in the audience, these were a lot of academic types, he said, early childhood stressors and traumas affect our health later on. Make sense to you? Do you know what happened in that meeting? They literally almost threw him out. They literally almost called security said, get this guy out of here. People were livid at him. They said, that's BS. There's no way there's any correlation. So to start to think about, we're gonna discuss a lot more of this, how do these early childhood experiences cause disease and problems later in life? How do they do it? They have to adjust, kind of set that computer program that regulates or dysregulates our physiology and leads to disease. Yeah? Now they're doing studies, aren't they, where the epigenetics of your Parents. We're gonna, yeah, we'll cover, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's on this slide. So how ACEs cause disease, as she just said, there's an epigenetic component. Are you guys familiar with epigenetics? Cover, I'm gonna do a 30 second elevator speech. The genes, or you know our genes, only 50% of the gene is the DNA that's read by the cell to produce proteins, hormones, whatever, whatever. The other 50% of the gene is a protein covering that can either cover up parts of the gene or slide away or unravel and uncover it, okay? So epigenetics means that certain experiences in our life or that are picked up generationally affect which of our genes are expressed or not expressed. So for example, there are certain genes that allow us to handle stress better or not better, okay? There are certain genes, like you and I can have the exact same thing happen that we, it's not fun, it's not comfortable, and I might react 10 times more stress, and you're like, man, it was a bother, but I blew it off and went on with my life. Okay, you're just your ability to handle it might be much better than mine, or something like that. Um, these ACEs cause disease, it sensitizes fear centers in our brain, just like the sensors on the car. They may be tuned up a lot. Folks are very sensitized to relatively smaller stimuli. Um, anyway, there's a dysregulated stress response to life and it essentially puts folks in a chronic fight, flight, freeze, autopilot, okay? These folks, the more ACEs you have, these folks generally feel bad. They feel overwhelmed all the time. They engage in risky addictive behaviors and coping mechanisms, so you know, you name it. They eat too much, they're obese, they smoke too much, alcohol, drugs, sex, and then all the things that go with that, okay? Um, what I've written in red here, I just wanna spend a couple minutes on it, because this, this red thing is like something that after 25 years of doing this, it's a metaphor, but again, it's pretty accurate, okay? So have you guys all heard the expression, people always say my plate is full, you guys all heard that expression, right? Okay, so what I think that means is that all of us, our nervous system's like a plate, and there's only so much stuff. You like that technical word? There's only so much stuff that we can handle on our plate before we get pushed over that threshold, that kind of pushes us into a fight, flight, freeze, stress state. It kind, of, it kind of creates this generic stress or anxiety feeling inside, and then everybody learns to respond to that differently depending on how they learn to cope as kids. So some people, their plate's too full, they isolate themselves. Some people are angry all the time, or anxious, or depressed, or engage in any one of a number of addictive behaviors. All those things are secondary to getting pushed over that stress threshold, having too much on your plate, got it? There's a lot of talk if, with physician resilience. What do you do with that? Okay, you gotta dump stuff, dump stuff off the plate, right? They're trying to clear stuff off the plate, help with Health Connect, it's really good. Now there's also data that shows that people that have a lot of adverse childhood experiences and stressors when they're young, it affects our neurology such that we have a very small plate, okay? One of the reasons I'm good at this is I, for my past, I had a very small plate. Now, I didn't know any different. 
I mean, you may have, your plate may be like this, but all I do is what I knew. My plate was this big, so I was constantly getting stressed, overwhelmed, feeling all these negative thoughts and emotions, sick all the time, okay? So, people could go to a therapist. Therapists are awesome, we love them. They talk about their stuff, they pour the stuff off the plate, but at the end of the session, their plate is still this big, okay? In my experience, experience and opinion, the psychiatric medications, they're awesome, they've helped millions of people, thank God for them, but at the end of the day, the plate, is still this big. The paradigm shift is, what if you got a much bigger cup or plate? What if like, instead of my one ounce shot glass, I was able to get like a 64 ounce big gulp? <laughs> then you can handle a lot more stuff coming to you from life without going into the stress physiology, having these, uh, you know, bad thoughts, feelings, emotions, behaviors, okay? That's a paradigm shift. There's almost nothing that I'm aware of that gives folks a bigger cup or plate. The TREs, in my experience, do that over time, it's a process. Yes? One of the other things that might be kind of cool is going from a paradigm where you have a plate um, that's full of crap to a cup that fills it over with good stuff. Yeah, but what one of the challenges, that is true, that's an excellent point. Yeah. One of the challenges with that, there's something called the upper limits problem. So right, everyone gets how the bad stuff fills up our plate, it feels bad. The challenge is, and I bet most of you in this room can relate to what I'm gonna say next, either personally or you know somebody. For people with a very small plate, even seemingly good things, positive things, uh, you know, intimacy and love, health, financial success, even seemingly good positive things, if you have a small plate, can feel bad. They call it the upper limits problem. A lot of people have stuff like, I don't know, like one example, you know, a couple's gonna go away on a romantic three-day weekend, and just before they leave on the trip, a fight breaks out. And you can definitely say, oh yeah, he was said this and this to me, and I, he would say, she was doing this and this. The bottom line is the fight had to break out to limit the amount of energy. Or someone's gonna take a week off from work and they get the flu right when they take off. Okay, again, objectively, is there a virus of the person? Yes, but at a higher level of truth, it had to happen to kind of limit the positive energy. So that is valid, and we're gonna actually talk about introducing some positives and training our neurology to handle that. But for a lot of people with a small plate, even good or positive things actually feel bad to them. There's one of my teachers, Steve Parker, used to say that security is not what feels good, it's what feels familiar. So you have someone who's used to feeling that crud all the time, you can introduce a lot of positive stuff to them, it may not feel that good to them, though, in their body. Okay, so that's that. We're gonna review the autonomic nervous system, and then I think we're gonna take just a little break this talk is kind of a little heavy stuff. People tend to resonate. Their own stuff sometimes tends to resonate with a talk like this. I'm gonna take some little, uh, a little music break. The music actually you're gonna to get to apply what we're learning here to these everyday Broadway uh, tunes, show tunes actually. Um, it's just to take also a mental break. There's a, there's, a re there's a method to the madness here. Okay, just a couple things I wanna point out. All right, uh, so you see here, the, 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 the different systems, parasympathetic, sympathetic. So cardiovascularly, when there's increased sympathetic tone, there's a faster heart rate, right? Parasympathetic slows it down. Um, sympathetic dilates the bronchi, parasympathetic constrict it. So if someone's got asthma and they're having bronchoconstriction, it's probably more of a parasympathetic, right? Okay. Um, the, the muscles are relaxed when you're more in that rest and digest, parasympathetic. Muscles tend to contract and stay tense more in a sympathetic. Um, urinary tract, yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know, the bladder squeezes, it works better, you know, you know, when there's parasympathetic. If there's too much parasympathetic, people have to pee too often, then we use an anticholinergic medication for that, right? GI, this is kind of uh, uh, true to my heart because of my sister's situation. Her gut basically stopped working, as I mentioned. She had no gut motility. At the end, she needed a subtotal colectomy. Um, and uh, they even, when that didn't help, that's when kind of was the end. But at any rate, so say Leslie's gut stopped working. Was she more over, was she riding more overall sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic. Sympathetic, sympathetic right? And that probably was not just a one time thing. That was probably her tone was set to a little bit of an autopilot. The gut was not working. Now, by the way, with irritable bowel syndrome, there's sometimes too much parasympathetic. You're overstimulating, too much secretions, the bowels are pumping too fast, there's diarrhea, there's cramping, then the sympathetic hits. It's driving to Vegas with the gas in the brake. Then the sympathetic hits. Everything slows down, there's bloating and constipation. The physiology is it, literally doing that. It's a dysautonomia. 
This, what I'm describing is not the exception. This is how it is, actually, guys. Okay, I used to think that the stuff I'm describing to you was like in the realm of a naturopath or chiropractors. This actually should be in our realm. It's all physiology. 